We cover cropping the corvids on cover crops. Paul Childerly has laid back guide to jackdaw control. He's stunned all day. Yeah. Very stunned all day. Fair play to him. Ever wondered how to shoot fit ask? Ben Hustwaite has the answer. This is a new skeet vest for me and I didn't have one on it so I just used Tipex. So that's all it is. <laughs> And I'm here at the Blaser Mousers, our Minox Skills Day, just south of Bristol's. We have news, we have hunting YouTube. Welcome to Field Sports Britain. I wouldn't like to write a job description for the role of gamekeeper. Few jobs can match the variety of tasks and pressures. This morning it's all about game cover crop protection. The recent drilling has attracted the attention of geese, pigeons, crows, rooks and jackdaws. Paul knows we'll get some shooting but it's going to be tough. Most of his kit has gone AWOL and there's not a single decoy. Some of Nick Norman decoys, not even the placky ones, ones in the freezer all been taken. I've got some old netting which is not actually netting. Look at the state of this. Equipment been used, borrowed and stolen. The maize planted here is vital to this shoot's success. All sorts of wildlife want to eat it from rabbits to birds to the infamous Chinese water deer which are untouchable until November. This will be ring fenced. Two strands, electric fence 24-7. Just another mammoth job to do but you've got to do it to get, you know, get, the, get the crop all through the season. Yeah, feet. I mean, holding is probably the, the most important thing. But yeah, a bit of feed as well. That sort of like keeps them interested in the area. Saves the food bill. And what about choice of cover crop? Um, again, different preference, different different estates. And we use uh, maize blocks here now. Basically, we use it because some of the plots are quite small. Um, it's quite easy to farm. Tense maize straight through. Um, we have done it in the past when we split half maize, half different wild bird and bits and pieces. But then it gets awkward spraying um, and we find when it's in the smaller blocks we get a lot more problem with vermin eating it. Um, so we tend to like try and make it bigger blocks, easier to manage, easier to spray and hopefully it's better for the birds. Once we've dressed the set the first thing to do is get some birds on the deck to start a pattern. Paul needs all the help he can get. Come on, George. Make me shoot well. Perfect. Here we go. That one's for Crow. That was a classic uh, Andy Crow swing through. Take it straight, mate, no problem there. I thought Andy would have probably give you a little bit more training, David. But I was. Did you? Did you really? No. You stand all day? Crow stands all day. Fair play to him. <laughs> three for three, wasn't it? Yeah, you found your feet, wasn't it? Yeah, no problem. It's easy, this uh, crow shooting. Easy than stalking. <laughs> they definitely kill them, don't they? That one was for Crow and that one was for George. <laughs> yeah, serious. What do you expect? I'm not being funny. Most gamekeepers and people that do this sort of thing, they're, they're all good shots, reasonable shots. Like I say, it's all I used to do when I was younger. Shoot pigeons, shoot crows, shotgun in my hand, and uh, yeah, it's not a big deal, is it? Shoot a few pigeons and crows, walk in the park. Quite enjoyable though, makes a change. 
but I do like the comfortable sort of like scenario. I'm not really into leaning over all day hunched up. I like the armchair hide. These look like they've been stolen from the comprehensive Ooh. school. Church. Not stolen though, they were donated. Yeah. Ah. Blame you for that one, David. Full use of the gun. The shotgun is a keeper's companion and Paul's new Remington semi-auto is proving to be his new best friend. Well, the shotgun is a bit of a multi-tool for a gamekeeper, isn't it? What would he use this one for? This, basically for armor control, something you have in the truck all the time, something you have on the quad bike all the time for everything from we uh, stoats and weasels around the pheasant pen to, to foxes, crows, pigeons, everything really. Ba basically a total universal gun really. Have you got a five shot? This is a four shot actually, um, but I have got a uh, multi shot as well, which is over over uh, four. Um, but yeah, it's good. It's good. You know, plastic stock, easy to use, easy to clean. Um, nice safe system on it. Pick it forward, put it back. Stays open and safe. Obviously, you've got the magazine still full. But it's quite nice. Nice safe system. Then we've got to empty the magazine right down. Ready to fire. Oh, got the left. Oh, thanks, David. That comes compliments coming from you. You've seen many a good shot in your time. The hassle weights, the big weeds. Hassle Hassle weight, isn't it? I thought you said. Hassle hop. Oh, the hass. The hop, sorry. The hass. Hassle weight. Hassle hop. Hassle Yeah, you're right. Yeah, and uh, the crow man, the crow moister. And now the childrenator. <laughs> Oh, nice. It's been a solid bit of shooting, and even if he hadn't connected, it's kept the birds off this precious game cover crop, which needs all the help it can get. For more information about Remington shotguns, go to ratradeuk.co.uk. Well done, Paul. Didn't know he could shoot a shotgun. Now, for someone who shoots around corners, it's David on the Field Sports Channel News Stump. This is Field Sports Channel News. The media is doing its act of being appalled that Prince George is allowed to play with a water pistol. British newspapers, which are seeing a huge decline in readership, point out that the four-year-old prince is playing with the toy gun amid a national surge in violence. The future king is with his sister, Princess Charlotte, and mother as they watch the Duke of Cambridge take part in a polo match. He played with other toys, including plastic handcuffs and a colourful slinky. But newspapers could find nothing to criticise about that. Death threats from Antis has stopped the traditional appearance of the Berwickshire hunt at the Haddington Show. Violent animal rights activists forced Scotland's oldest fox hunting pack to cancel its appearance at the East Lothian County Fair on the 30th of June, after what one newspaper called a deluge of threats. Antis are forcing a cash-strapped Scottish council to find £15,000 to pay for a mediator over wildfowling. A small number of activists want to end shooting in Findhorn Bay, even though wildfowling is both legal and free around the whole of the Scottish coastline. They're doing it by trying to get Moray Council to pass a bylaw against it. Council may have to spend the money to resolve the conflict. Brownells is back. The US gun parts retailer briefly lost its YouTube channel. Brownells called for followers of its social media account to send complaints to Google, YouTube's parent company, and it seems to have done the trick. So far, Brownells is the only YouTube gun channel to be accidentally taken down since YouTube announced a crackdown on backyard bomb-making videos. A lion hunt has gone ahead in South Africa after the hunting guide invoked the South African constitution. A trophy hunter shot the elderly male lion last week in the Umbabat private game reserve next to the Kruger National Park. Sandparks originally opposed the application for the hunt, but one lion was approved as a sustainable hunt in February, based on Section 24 of the Constitution of South Africa. Another Bollywood actor is under suspicion of poaching. While Hollywood actors enjoy legal hunts, Bollywood stars seem to be drawn to the illegal. Interpol has served a legal notice on Saif Ali Khan, star of the hit film Carla Candy, after his agent organised a wild boar hunt in Bulgaria without permission and licences. 
The news follows fellow actor Salman Khan's five-year jail sentence for poaching a black buck in India. And finally, a seagull gets a little territorial when a remote-controlled plane does a flyby. The white-bellied sea eagle is snapped chasing two toy gliders flying in its airspace over Middleton Beach in Western Australia. The photographer says the sea eagle chases after the gliders and appears to be playing with them. He adds that the eagle is regularly mobbed by local seagulls, so may be trying to get its own back. You are now up to date with Field Sports Channel News. Stalking the stories, fishing for facts. Thank you, David. Now, Ben Hustwaite has found a way to explain Fitask with Tipex. So in this segment, we're just gonna have a quick look at the FITAS mount. A lot of people are moving into FITAS and especially with the World Championships being in the UK next year, it's something that we could, we should all try and support. So on the FITAS mount, you can see the line on my, on my vest here, the highest part of the stock, so if we shoot a Monte Carlo like this, the highest part of the stock has to be below the line until the target is visible. And that doesn't mean we can hear the machine and mount. So we have to keep this below this line until the target is in the air and visible. So what happens is you place the gun, eyes go back to your viewpoint, you call pull, you wait until you see the target, then the mount can begin and then the shot's taken from there. So first of all, let's cover what can go wrong during this mount. One, we have the gun too far back. So when we call pull, we have to go forward and then back. Um, and the next one is, what people do is they slide, and this is the biggest problem with FITAS, is when you slide your mount. So when you've picked your hold point here, when you call pull, you move from this position and slide and mount on the move, you've then left your hold point. So, and that is one of the biggest, biggest problems I've seen. What I like to do is use a bayonet style mount. So as I call pull, I mount forward before rotation. So I do not move sideways until I have connection to my face. So a bayonet mount and then the rotation. One of the biggest, biggest problems also with a low gun, I'm gonna need Dave to come in and just help me with this just to explain. So is actually how we line up. If you can just stand this, this, this face this way for me, Dave. Take the gun for me. So if you imagine that the, uh, the head row there is the line of the target. Yep. Close the gun and get from your fit ass mount. So what we actually see is what a lot of people do is they mount eye, bead, line. So they've got this perfect straight line to the target's flight path. But as you can see, that actually ramps the barrel clean over the line. So when Dave mounts, he would have to drop below the line, back up, and then try and move. So he's actually gonna come into the line at a small angle. That window of opportunity to break that clay is very, very small. Can so, you explain that again, John? Just go through that again for me. So what Dave's gonna to have to do, if he gets the barrel, if he lines up in the, in, the, in the triangular method, when he mounts, this hand will take lead, the barrel will dip, and he, then he's gonna come up on an angle. So if you imagine the target's flight line is here, Dave's, when he gets to mounted, the barrel is underneath, so he's going to have to intersect. Where these two lines meet is the only possible chance of that target breaking. If he pulls the trigger too soon, he's underneath. If he pulls the trigger too late, he's high. The window of opportunity is very, very small. So what I like to tell, and, and what we're going to do with Dave now, is when you close the gun, use your two fingers to point at the line through each other, and you'll notice the barrel comes up a lot lower. So let's try that, Dave. So now we're going to the hedge. You can see Dave's fingers and fingers are pointing to the hedge. He's now perfectly in line, considerably lower than he was before. Then when he complete the mount, he lifts, he's on line, 
then the rotation, he's pulling away on the flight line of the target. It makes a huge, huge difference. How often do you see people being penalised? The British refs are the worst. They really are sticklers for the rules. Um, when you go abroad into Europe, they tend to be very, very lapsed. I actually got a warning at the weekend for, I had a warning before I started. I actually mounted the gun in the parking lot and got a warning because one of the referees is a bit of an overachiever and it gave him great joy in giving me one. So good luck to him with that. But um, what I'd like to see is one of the, um, if, if Dave was new to FITAS and I was a referee and Dave just closed the gun for me, Dave, and Dave just got a little bit too high, called Paul, I'd let him take the shot and then just say to him, sir, just, just be careful with your gun mount. You know, you don't have to give a warning out all the time. If myself or one of my highly esteemed competitors creep that mount, we deserve to be told. We know the rules, we're there to win, but I don't. But I believe to, to help the sport grow, sometimes a quiet word in the ear is, is, is a little bit more helpful than a warning. On the white line, why have you got a white line? Uh, it, all it has to be is a, temp, is a, is a permanent white line. That's all, that's all they ask for. And um, this is a new skeet vest for me and I didn't have one on it, so I just used Tipex. So that's all it is. <laughs> <laughs> that's why it's there. Dave's actually had his stitched on. But my sister works in the sewing factory. <laughs> <laughs> so that's where we're at. <laughs> but everyone needs that line. Has to be there, yeah. Yeah, it has to be there, permanent line, 23 centimetres from the top of your shoulder. So... I'm just now going to demonstrate the sliding mount, which for me is, is bad, and then also the bayonet mount, which is for me the way we should be mounting the gun from that FITAS line. So we're going to be shooting quite a good way out, crossing bird from right to left. I've picked my hold point as above this, uh, this brick building here. So if I go to that hold point now, as you can see, my barrel is running through my fingers to the height. My eyes are back on the viewpoint. Now on this one, I'm going to slide my mount. And you'll see when the gun hits my shoulder, I will have actually moved in front of this bird and then I will have to stop moving and restart again. Pull. And you can see that was a three moves and that is what I don't want. I slid across the mount. I, then the clay was back here at the hole point. I stopped and had to retake the shot. Fortunately, I broke it but I'm borderline there when I can do that consistently for a miss. So what I'm going to be looking for now is a bayonet mount. At my hold point, everything's going to go forward and I'm going to get to the hold point at the same time as the clay. I'm then going to connect, hold the clay before moving out to my positive lead. Okay. Pull. That felt a lot better to me. I actually killed it a lot quicker because I didn't have to put the brakes on. As I did my bayonet mount, when I hit my face, the clay was right on the end of the gun. When I'm moving with it, I'm learning its speed, I'm learning its line before I rotate out to my pre-planned positive lead. There are your two different mounts. If you are finding yourself sliding, just make sure you try and work that left hand forward into the clay. What I try and tell my students, you know, I, was, I grew up boxing, and I jab, jab the bird. So you see that bird coming. So you push this left hand into the target, into the target before rotation. Don't slide across that line. So once again, this will be the sliding movement. I'm at my hold point here. The target comes out, pull. I slide across, mount. I have to stop, wait for the target again before I move to my positive lead. That changed my kill point and totally mistimed the shot. I'm now guessing my line and speed. What I'm going to do this time is at the hole point, I'm going to jab into the bird. I'm going to bayonet mount first, no sideways movement before, before I'm fully mounted. Pull, bayonet mount, hold the clay, rotate and take the shot. There are your two different mounts. Being fairly new to fit us, Ben, gun fit, is it paramount? Yeah, not just gun fit, but also the balance. So you can have a perfectly fitted gun, but if you can't mount it consistently, that's also going to cause you, yeah. cause you a headache. But whilst we're talking of gun fit, I know this fit you are. I fitted it. So um, we, also, we also did the balance. So if you just mount the gun for me, I know it's empty. I'm just going to talk through, talk through the gun fit. So when I'm looking at gun fit, what I'm looking for, 
A lot of people talk about fingers up here and things like that. I'm not interested. What I'm looking for is complete fit on the, on, the, on the pad here. I don't want to see this. We want this fully mounted. As you can see, Dave's got the perfect mount there. He's got 100% contact. We're looking at placement on the cheek here. We're looking at the finger length. We're looking at the finger when it goes onto the trigger. We're pulling it with the pad. We're not hooking. Um, this is all relative to the, to the shooter as an individual. But the key thing what I'm looking for is the angle of the arm here. So many people say you need to have this right up here. You know, if you've got a short neck, big chest, you are going to just pull your head back for me, Dave. You are going to be back here. That's just, that's just how people are made. But what we do need to do is get this angle right here. We get this angle right, we loosen the triceps, loosen the triceps, we loosen the lats, lats working down into the lower back. That is what's going to enable us to turn. And they're the three key factors and also the balance. What I'm going to do is look between Dave's hands on where he holds the gun, find the middle point. And that's where I'm going to balance the gun from. Just lower it, mate, I know they're heavy. I'm going to try and balance the gun just a little bit towards being stock heavy so we actually got the heavy end out in front. If I had the light end out in front, sorry. If I describe that to you in layman's terms, if I put a drawing pin into a wall, take a sledgehammer, take the wooden handle and hold it here with the heavy end out in front and ask you to hit that pin, you're not going to be able to do it. That's going to be everywhere. If I turn that round, put the heavy end here, I can do whatever you want with that end. And that's what I want to do with the end of my barrel. I want to be able to place it in certain places on something this big sometimes 50, 60, 70 yards away. So gun fit is paramount. And again, you can always practice your fit ass mount at home for yeah. free. But uh, yeah, it's a good question. And gun fit for me is very, very important. Brilliant. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Ben. Now, boar in Bristol, the vegan capital of the world. We're here at the Blaser Moser Zauer Minox Skills Day. What happens when you mix 150 Field Sports Channel viewers and three and a half thousand rounds of ammo? You have quite a weekend. Yay! Well, what do you expect as we join Blaza, Sporting and Braces of Bristol as they host three days of tuition, technical advice and access to hundreds of thousands of pounds worth of hardware. I think we've got nearly half a million pounds worth of equipment on site right now. No dealer in the world can stock this and, have an, and be informed about it. So having this event means that everybody at least gets a sniff at that, knows about the cap capabilities of the equipment and knows how to set Listen it up. Listen to your instructors, we've got uh, three firing points. I mean, sometimes the problem is that we are so busy, always hustling for business, that sometimes our customers know more about our product and the variation of it, because they're the guys on the internet, they're coming home, they're sifting through the internet. When we are opening a beer, not wanting to see another rifle because we've talked rifle all day, that's when they go and pursue their hobby. So this is not surprising me, there is the odd embarrassing situation where somebody's been on the internet between 8 and 10 at 9 and then they're calling you up and say, oh, you've just launched this and you just go like, have we? And um, th th so actually the problem is we're not out enough. We're not in touch with our customers enough. We're not interacting with other manufacturers enough because everybody's just too busy doing their own thing. So for us, this is a great opportunity, A, to bring my team, for them to experience this hands-on. For example, my office manager, Jenny, now off she wants she wants to go into target shooting that's it she hasn't had that before but she's hooked and this is due to the fact that she's had this opportunity here and we're not doing this enough that's the problem how can we how can we talk passionately about our hobby which this is all about if we're not experiencing it enough Speaking to Blaza, Mauser, Zauer and Minox's representative on Earth, or are part of it at least, yeah, is as close to the manufacturer as you're going to get before you step on a plane. And knowledge is power. It means people come here to make informed choices about optics, night vision, thermal and how important it is to handle an Emberleaf knife with great care. So a single knife, uh, you can't do it in a single day, uh, but not including times that it's in heat treat or gluing times, maybe 10 hours, something like that, over two days, uh, using it's about 60 different processes using 17 different like 60, 60 different processes. 60 different processes, yeah, uh, covering about 17 different trades. 
Uh, so in, like machining, heat treating, polishing, yeah. lapidry, woodwork, or what? Or, or, lapidry, or, what you just made that up? <laughs> lapidry, is, uh, lapidry is basically polishing, uh, but po not polishing steel. So polish like uh, like so jewelry polishing jewelry is lapidry and stuff like that. It's, it's a trade, yeah. Every day's a school day. <laughs> <laughs> Someone showing a keen interest in a new knife when not on the shotgun layout is Mr. Crow. More like Mr. Magpie when things are a little shiny. Everyone's done a brilliant job here, they really have. I didn't come last year, so I wasn't invited, but... Um, um, you were missed last year. Yeah, but, but I, I think they were a bit desperate, they wanted someone to help out, so... They dragged me along this year, but, oh man, it's been great. Um, just helping people out with guns and that, and, and putting people straight on where they're going wrong. Um, no, it's been great fun. I've, I've really had a couple of good days. You had a go in the rifle at all? Yeah, I've had a go on the, the bolt and board, that was great. Yeah. I'd love the opportunity to go to Germany or something like that, uh, shooting real. Is this your plea? Is it now on, on it TV? It is, yeah. Now? I, 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 I don't think you've ever taken me out there, David, so it'd be nice nice if you took me out somewhere like Germany shooting wild board. What about Croatia? Well, Croatia. If this is a fun fair, the running wild boar is the waltzers. Everyone is drawn I to the moving you. target. Either that or the big Croatian. Another asshole. Even I can't resist. And someone else. Is anyone working here? Absolutely fantastic. They haven't been stumped yet with the questions I've asked, so yeah, they know their stuff. It's been superbly organised and instructors have got the patience of the saint. Have you had a go with the Blazer F16? I yet? have, yes. Possible? Yeah. Uh, yeah, very nice. I didn't miss much, so mm, that's another one that's on my radar, definitely. Max, we meet again. So what have you seen so far? What would you like? I want to get an F3. Anything free? I said F3. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were just looking for freebies. No, you're not. That as well, obviously. Especially for the event, Robert has had a very smart new row target commissioned. And yes, they are available. The actual picture of the road is an original piece of artwork made by a customer of ours called John Piper. And it was so great that I thought we should turn this into a training target. Everything is in proportion. So you've got an original size road deer here. You've got a marker here that says 660 centimeters to the ground. So if you prop this target up 660 centimeters to the ground, you've got your original road deer there. And to prolong the lifestyle span of this target, there are some markers here that mark the size of this patch, which is a copy of the original. So you can patch this up and voila, you've got yourself a new target. And if you keep shooting at the same area, that should basically quadruple the lifespan of this target, if not more. Now that row off stakes at 100 yards should be a doddle, but what if the circumstances dictate you need to take a longer shot? Well, this new design may be the answer. If you look out in the fields there, where, where we're looking out at about 180 yards, 200 yards, that's great, the stick's really, really stable. But if we go up to the top of the hill where you're out to 500 yards, um, then you've got movement. And this is the really lovely part that just by putting this, um, this, this uh, stabilizing line on, on the back, lifting up the rifle on the back of there. Now, basically I can adjust the tension on here, but I can also adjust by moving my foot. So I now push forward on here where the sticks no longer move for, for any further forward. And I can adjust this by, by moving the foot backwards and forwards for the tension that I may need. So when I'm in, in, in the shot, if I push on with the sticks, push forward, there's no movement at all. This year, the event is spread over three days with numbers limited to 50 people a day. It just means more time to dedicate to our lucky shooters. I'm really pleased with the result. I think the general feedback's been very good and uh, the staff, the experts we've had have been really good. <laughs> it's just quality time, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. That Something the, 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 the customers can take away with them. You tell the friend, oh, I shot play with Andy Crow and then Thomas Fettig taught me how to shoot the wild boar. That's not, not what bad going, is for. it? Exactly. Do they teach you that? <laughs> Have you learned anything? I don't even like guns anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and the combination of having Ben Belief and Thomas Jacks. Do you see Mission Creep, gentlemen? <laughs> it has just more interest, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. I mean, you, you know, last the first year that we did it, it was all new to us all. Uh, you know, it's never been done before. And it was fantastic to have the support of the Blaza Sauer Mauser guys, but it's also 
as it's growing, we need to have more things that will interest people. It's nice for them to be able to make the, the properly informed decision when they're looking at a, a number of different products. Um, and it's definitely something we would like to expand on. There's ideas I've got for what we're going to do next year. So it's sort of a watch this space. As Dan says, for 2019, watch this space. Well, watch this channel anyway, and you'll find out exactly what's going on. Well, thank you for that. A good time had by all. And from Bristol to the wider world of hunting and shooting on YouTube now, it is Hunting YouTube. This is Hunting YouTube, which aims to show the best hunting and shooting videos that YouTube has to offer. Morton Schultz gets in touch about his new film where he shoots a six-pointer a couple of minutes before sunset, but he says his main aim is to show the moods and beauty of Danish hunting and wildlife. A significant departure for Yorkshire rose stalking, he's using his GoPro and of course his shotgun over decoys. Can't stop those Humphreys! This is one of a few films put up by Nigel Humphreys about fox and rabbit shooting with night vision. Zubtech Hunting puts up Night Prowler, a film about his first experience hunting wild pigs with a thermal imager, he is in New South Wales, Australia. Duck hunting opening weekend 2018 and Clark Boys hunting NZ head down to the Mai Mai to see if they can bag a few. Roger Barborn gets in touch from Sweden about his channel which specialises in hunting kit tests. This is pattern testing. The one thing, don't let's forget, that Ben Husthwaite can't stand. The clay shooting season is well underway, trap, skeet and the rest are well covered by this channel from the International Shooting Sports Federation. Here talking to our own Amber Hill at the new ground in Malta. And and finally, following a spate of dog thefts around the UK recently, I want to show one of our films. This is the story of Dog Lost, the remarkable agency that tries to reunite dog owners with their usually kidnapped animals. That's it for this week. I've put all these films into a playlist for you. Click on the i symbol top right or check this film's description. If you have a YouTube film you would like us to pop into the weekly top eight, email me the link charlie at fieldsportschannel.tv. Well, we are back next week. If you haven't done so already, please pop over to our website, fieldsportschannel.tv. You can click to like us there on Facebook and on Instagram. You can follow us on Twitter. You can subscribe to us on YouTube. Best of all, you can pop your email address into our register page, and you can even put down your name to buy shares in Field Sports Channel. We're launching on Crowdcube soon. We're at 7 p.m. UK time every Wednesday. This has been Field Sports Britain. Good hunting, good shooting, good fishing, and goodbye.